Okay. Well, uh, well, we'll just go ahead, I think. So, uh, I am William Jones. I am Ember Cosmos AI and Machine Learning Lead, and I am here today to talk about open source dynamic calls and modeling of COVID-19. Uh, so, a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about some backgrounds of what led us to this project. I'm going to talk about dynamical systems and dynamic calls and modeling for those who haven't met it before. I'm going to talk about the work we've done here. I'm going to talk about the work we intend to do in the future. So the starting point for this is my PhD a few years ago. My research work was in computational neuroscience. And as part of that, I did quite a lot of uh, Bayesian modeling. So when the COVID-19 pandemic came around, I was very interested in seeing which um, Bayesian techniques were being applied to do this. And uh, one thing that I was very interested to see is that the um, dynamic causal modeling technique that I had seen somewhere during my PhD that came out of the um, functional imaging laboratory at UCL was being applied to solve being applied to solve the problems of COVID as well and to, to predict what was going to happen. I thought this was very interesting because my familiarity with dynamic causal modeling had sort of I don't know, it's a very, very interesting technique that has quite a lot going for it, and it always seemed a shame to me that it was limited to the neuroscience domain. And that sort of leads us to, to, to the project that we're doing here, which was a, a project for me to look at how we could apply dynamic calls and modeling in a sort of more general context. It wasn't just limited to neuroscience or limited to COVID-19. But there, there were some problems that we, well, would be a very interesting presentation if it, if it was very, very easy. Um, there, there were some challenges we, we came across along the way. One of these challenges is that the only real implementations of dynamic causal modeling at the moment exist inside the SPM neuroscience toolbox, which is written in MATLAB. And I, I do want to give credit where credit's due. The SPM team do work quite hard to make things Octave compatible where they can, but the fundamental fact is MATLAB is the first class citizen and things work in Octave if they work in Octave. Um, Secondly, the, the um, sort of if one wanted to write their own implementation from scratch of dynamic calls and modeling, the, the theory is, is um, very difficult to get into. Uh, and I, I might even go so far as to say a little bit of juice. Uh, so, so I sort of started 95% of the way to understanding this stuff from my background. I had resources that people don't have and that I could go and like talk to my old PhD supervisor who, do, who does this stuff and ask questions about it. And it was still really, really difficult for me to get a good finger hold on what I was doing um, with this. Also, um, currently, as I said, this exists as implemented in the SPM neuroscience toolbox. And there's only really two applications for this. There's the neuroscience stuff and there's more recently the COVID-19 model. And you know, this is fair enough. It's a technique that was developed for neuroscience. It is well and good that it is, you know, applicable for this stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I think it would be nice if it was applied more widely. And, and that's ultimately what this project is about. And the, the stuff I'm discussing today is the, the sort of first step we've taken in looking at applying dynamic calls and modeling more widely. And what we did here is we essentially decided we'd saw off a little bit of the uh, SPM toolbox uh, and try and create our own standalone port of the dynamic causal modeling for COVID-19 stuff from the SPM toolbox and ultimately to sort of see what we learned from this and see what we would need to do to make a uh, sort of more generalized implementation of dynamic causal modeling. So that's the background to what we're doing. Um, I, I'm now going to talk through some of the, just a really brief, quick run through of dynamic causal modeling theory and what it is for those who haven't met it. And I'm going to frame this in terms of dynamical systems. So for those who have not met dynamical systems, a dynamical system consists of two things. One is a state and the other is a set of rules for evolving that state. To put that into like less abstract and more concrete terms, we can consider the state to be planetary bodies. And specifically, we can consider the, the state of, say, planetary body A to be its position and its velocity, and uh, so on for each of the, the other planets. And then our rules for how this state would change 
would be the rules of physics. And this would be things like, you know, that the instantaneous force on A at any point is proportional to A's relative mass to each of the other planets and uh, its distance from them. And yeah, that, that is a dynamical system. And solving a dynamical system um, in this context is trying to, well, undifferential equation, this differential equation here in a manner of speaking. So we have a rule for changing our state over time, but we don't have a way of necessarily just getting our state at any time. And that is the thing to solve. We want an equation that is dependent on time. So we can just like plug, so we can plug into our system. I want to know where my planets are at year 200, and then we get where the planets are at year 200, instead of having to wind through the deltas to get there. So that is your, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, and just to say very quickly, I won't, we won't go on this too much, but um, while dynamical systems are useful, finding such solutions is hard. Generally, you end up solving a bunch of simultaneous differential equations, and it's hard to do analytically. You generally end up using numerical approximations. Um, but that is what it is. We, we won't go on that. One, um, I, I'm going to call these probabilistic dynamical systems, but I think the nomenclature is, is broader than that. Uh, it doesn't matter. One thing we can do with our probabilistic dynamical systems or our dynamical systems is put probabilistic elements in them. So sometimes we have either statistical randomness or uncertainty about things in our dynamical system, and that's something we can account for. It does, it, it changes how we look at the problem a bit, but it doesn't change the ultimate goal. It, so say we have uncertainty about our planetary body E, the sort of moon that is orbiting A. The result of this is that, you know, E, we have uncertainty about E, and so we have uncertainty about all the things that E affects. And ultimately what this means is that, well, our whole system is uncertain, and what we're getting out at the end isn't going to be a single fixed point solution. It's going to be many solutions, and it's going to be many solutions, each of which, an associate, each of which has an associated probability, um, you know, which corresponds to one particular state that E might have been in. Um, yeah. Um, so now let's talk about the inverse problem. So those are those are classical dynamical systems, and you know, uh, as I talked about, we we generally with those want to solve time. Another type of setup we might want to do with dynamical systems, or well, even outside of dynamical systems, is to look at sort of the, the inverse problem of the one I've just described. So consider the case where we, for example, with our planetary system, we have the movement of all the planets except planet A over 100 years, and we have the rules of physics which tell us how all of those planets move, and what we want to reverse engineer is, is the missing bits of data, what the position of velocity of planet A was that led to this movement of all the other planets over a 100 year period. Um, and this is, this is an interesting one. If we just knew that, if we just have one missing part of our differential equations, we can reverse engineer things and we can solve them but we don't necessarily have that. Like if we didn't know there was only one missing part to our equation, there would be an infinite number of solutions, which is um, why, why the inverse problem is um, often so hard. Um, and, and just to say as well, the inverse problem, you know, you can solve this in a probabilistic context and the, the, the same thing happens as I described with the probabilistic dynamical systems. You essentially end up with many solutions and an associated probability with each um, and it is what it is. Uh, so where dynamic causal modeling comes in, oh. where dynamic causal modeling comes in, and I am oversimplifying a bit here, I, I, I may discuss around this a little bit more at the end, but broadly, dynamic causal modeling takes real world time data and a set of plausible, well, usually probabilistic dynamical systems models, and it tries to infer the best one of these models from the set of plausible models and the associated parameters of it. Why we want to do this? Well, one advantage is causality. Solving causality between explanatory variables is a genuinely difficult problem, and this is one way of getting at it. Um, so there's not really much more to say, though. It, it is a nice thing to be able to do, and we can do it here. Another thing is that sort of techniques like this, um, sort of the, 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 these Bayesian methods, are very good at accounting for uncertainty. When we are uncertain about things, instead of it basically being necessarily an obstacle, it's just sort of something we fold into our probabilistic system and then it becomes part of the solution. It just becomes, you know, our uncertainty 
found the solution at the end, and this is another nice thing. Um, doing things like this is also fundamentally very, very explainable. If we end up with a probabilistic dynamical system as our, as our explanation of our observed time series, that, that's nice. You know, we have not just all of our explanatory variables, we have how they're, they're interlinked, and that's a very useful thing to be able to do. Finally, um, and this isn't quite, this is a slightly different point to the other ones. Um, so, so, so far I've discussed the fact that, you know, we can infer causality, we can account for uncertainty. Obviously something you can do with a similar system is the forecast. So you can do your dynamic cause modeling, or you can generate your dynamic probabilistic, uh, probabilistic dynamical system on one batch of your time series. And then if you want to predict the rest, you can just wind it forward. You know, that's a, again, a nice thing to be able to do. And up until this point, you know, as I have said, dynamic causal modeling has generally been applied in the neuroscience domain. And, and the types of problems we're trying to solve here is we stick someone in an fMRI, we do an experiment on them, we get fMRI readings of them while they're doing that experiment, and then we're, we're trying to infer connectivity and causality between different regions of the brain um, while that experiment's happening. And that's, you know, that, that is an interesting research problem to be able to solve. In the context, uh, you know, perhaps more contemporaneously interesting, as I said, dynamic causal modeling has recently been applied to modeling COVID-19. Um, here, instead of you know, interlinked brain regions, interlinked uh, planets, we have interlinked factors of infection. So the location of people, are they at work, are they at home, their infection status, are they susceptible, infected, infectious, are they um, immune? clinical status, are they asymptomatic, symptomatic, very symptomatic or dead, um, and their testing status. Are they tested, untested, do they have a positive test, do they have a negative test? And the goal of the dynamical systems, um, sorry, dynamic causal modeling here, is to infer a dynamical system that accounts for all of the factors I've just described on the basis of the number of observed deaths and potentially the number of the observed positive COVID tests too. And the end result as such looks, um, looks like this, which, um, which illustrates an interesting point I also want to discuss a bit more. So as I said, the, the model, we feed the model the number of deaths and as one might expect, um, sorry, black dots here indicate observed data, blue lines indicate um, predictions from the model. Anyway, we, we feed the model the number of deaths and shock horror, the model does quite a good job of predicting the number of observed deaths from this. What's very interesting is that as part of our um, plausible dynamical systems, we specified that admissions and ventilated patients are, are part of those systems. And the model's actually done quite a good job of inferring the number of um, hospital admissions and number of ventilated patients, which are really important statistics, without actually having directly observed them, which is a a very nice and useful thing to be able to do. So that is you know, a, a brief whistle stop to the dynamic causal modeling. I hope I have not um, any important things there. The, the project. So as I said, we wanted to see if we could apply dynamic causal modeling in a wider context. And as a start to this, we wanted to take the dynamic causal of modeling for COVID-19 from the SPM toolbox and make it its own standalone in the free and open source Octave programming language. Um, and the rest of this talk is about, um, well, what we learned from doing this and, and what we, where we might take things in future having had the knowledge from doing this. So the first thing is the language because the original reference implementation for dynamic causal modeling and this COVID-19 um, implementation was in uh, MATLAB and we wanted a free and open source implementation. We chose to do it in Octave. Um, ob obvious reason to do this, Octave isn't tactically compatible with MATLAB. If you write MATLAB code, it should, barring um, almost uh, a, a few very tiny differences, run in Octave. Uh, and uh, that is nice. And I've got to say, in this instance, it worked out for us. But I'm not actually sure we would make the same decision again, and we probably won't be doing stuff in Octave if we take this forward. And the reason for that is it worked for us this time because the SPM guys have put quite a lot of work into making their code compatible with Octave. If they hadn't done that, it might have actually been very difficult. And the problem here is that 
Octave is maintained by a, you know, a very dedicated and very clever group of volunteers who do this stuff essentially for free. Whereas MATLAB is maintained by a very large team of engineers who have just money poured over them by MathWorks to make the, the MATLAB tool well, good and work. And as a result, it's very, very easy. MATLAB has a lot of functionality Octave doesn't have, and it's very, very easy if you're using up-to-date MATLAB to just sort of do things like use strings, which Octave doesn't have, and then write code that, that ends up being very difficult or time, more time consuming to replicate than Octave. And this might be fine in isolation, but the other fact of the matter is that Octave is kind of slow. MATLAB is often touted to be about as quick as Python, and in my experience, it, it, it is, and Octave isn't really. I mean, it depends a lot on the problem you're solving, but Octave is generally sort of two to 10 times slower, um, which is quite a lot slower uh, in the grand scheme of things. So the takeaway here is we did this in Octave this time. It worked out wonderfully. It was very easy, but we probably wouldn't do it in Octave again. We probably won't do it in Octave going forward. The Next thing we took away from this port or the work we did here um, was, uh, was about the, the code base. So the, 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 SPM, the, the SPM code base we were porting from is academic software written by academics or used by other academics. And in that, it, it does its job as code written for academics by academics really, really well. The end user documentation if you're using this stuff, it is really quite good. Um, what we struggled a bit more with was sort of a mix of code quality and system documentation. Though, if you want to do the type of stuff we're doing, where you're sort of ripping the guts of SPM out and doing stuff with it, the documentation for that is, I don't want to say it's bad, but it's very mixed. There are some bits which are really well documented and it's great, and there are other bits which are less well documented. And the same thing goes for the code quality. Again, there are some bits of SPM which are just lovely written, really easy to understand, and there are also some bits which are not. Um, and um, you know, the, the, our, our takeaway here was sort of a bit like, um, it's a good project, but you know, academics must publish or perish, and they don't get publications by you know, staying up all night writing really, really, really good code, um, though I, I know some of them try. Uh, also, as a sort of, I suppose, uh, addition to this, I, I didn't cover there, one of the things we tried to do with this software when we had got it working was to play around it, to sort of customize it, to mess around the model a bit and see what happened. And that was really, really hard. Um, again, understandably, you know, academics have written code to prove a point and uh, to demonstrate their research, not for me to play around with, but it, it was difficult to use and to do this type of stuff with. And that, that's the kind of thing we would like to see in you know, a, a general implementation. Sort of as a Continuation from this, um, uh, testing was, was another interesting thing in respect of this. So um, j just one quick point, and, and, and another reason we probably wouldn't use Octave to do this again, the, the MATLAB and Octave, despite the syntactic compatibility between the two languages, the end user, the user written testing suites for, for MATLAB and Octave by default aren't compatible. Um, they're, they're, they're just completely different. And if you want to do tests, you either have to write your test twice or you have to write your own testing suite that um, is compatible with, with both. Doesn't really matter, just a sort of side point here. What, what, what we found was um, sort of a limitation of this though when we came to actually writing these tests is that, is that the, the tests for the dynamic cause of modeling were, well, they were limited. Um, Again, I don't want to say they were bad, they were, they were functional, but they tested largely to see if the code ran and that it produced the sort of right shape of outputs. That really testing if they were, you know, the, in detail, whether they were the correct outputs. And again, this is like, I don't, I don't want to be critical about this. It's very understandable. You know, academics are writing code to prove a point, not like um, production code for, for stuff. And, testing dynamic cause modeling and these high level Bayesian techniques is very, very difficult. Um, but ultimately we do, you know, if we are applying this stuff, we do really need to know we're doing it right. And at the moment, it's actually very difficult to test that. Um, and that's something, you know, a takeaway here is that if we're making more general implementation of this, it's something we're gonna have to improve. As a little um, side note here as well, something we found very interesting was that we found that the dynamic cause of modeling stuff we had written uh, and ported was in, uh, inflating floating point errors a lot. 
um, w w which was interesting. So if we had, we were finding sort of starting with order, order errors of, sort of one e to the minus 15, by the end of the process, they were sort of boosted up to order of one e to the minus three. I know this wasn't qualitatively affecting results, but it was a, a bit larger than we were expecting and something, we, something we'd want to keep an eye on. We want to make sure that these things are numerically stable through different, different implementations and so on and so forth. Just, just an interesting point. Um, finally, the, the, the sort of final and I think most important thing we learned from doing this were, was um, about the, the, the theory um, surrounding this. You know, you know, if we want to write our own reference implementation from scratch, we have to understand in detail exactly how all of this works so that we can do it right. And at the moment, the theory is really, really, really dense, unforgiving, and as I said, almost a little bit of juice. Um, again, I don't want to blame the point, but like I, 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 with my background, was like I think like 95% of the way there to getting it, and it was a really painful last 5% to be able to write about it coherently. Um, and you know, again, this is understandable. This is academics writing for other academics, not academics writing for me doing engineering stuff. But again, it is, a, it is, if we want to make a general implementation of this stuff, you know, play around with it, something we will have to address because, uh, you know, we have to have engineers coding this stuff and if the engineers don't know what they're engineering, they can't do it. Um, so in summary, um, you know, we, we're interested in this dynamic course of modeling stuff and um, we're interested in, you know, writing and looking at a more general implementation. To do that, we need to pick a better language than the one we tried to do this time, which was Octave. Um, you know, Octave was great for this time, but I probably would pick a different one in future. When we do this, we're going to need some really solid software engineering backing this. Um, you know, we're going to need to, um, we're going to have to have the code really well written, really thoroughly documented, and really good tests. And we're also going to probably need to make the theory. Um, a bit more accessible, at least to the people who are writing the code. So that is the end of the presentation. Oh, um, quickly as well, uh, here, here is the, the, the work we've done on this. So our, our code is available on our GitHub repo. Um, and some of the things that I discussed uh, that, that we felt were difficult, like the theory and the sort of system level documentation of the um, SPM code base, we have had a stab at making contribution at making these things better. I have written my understanding of the theory, which was hopefully more accessible. And we have written in the practical blog post about sort of some system level documentation and some advice if one wants to customize at least the things that we were working on in the SPM for COVID-19. Uh, and that is the end of my talk. Any questions? Uh, the microphone. William, I think um, one of the, the slides will be published, but it might be worth pointing out that we need to provide some links to those posts. So while you're answering other questions, I'll dig those posts out and um, put them on the chat channel. But we also want to put them on the web page after. What a splendid idea, Jeremy. <clears throat> Just as someone who's forgotten everything he learned about MATLAB at university, mm -hmm. um, what, what is the appeal of, of that language and, and what is it that you're going to be looking for? In what, what, do you mean, what, what is the appeal of MATLAB or? Uh, yeah, in, in this context. And, and what it's you fast, it's for? easy to use. Yeah. Um, genuinely, like I said, MATLAB is genuinely about as quick as Python and it's really easy to get coding in. Even if you're not particularly a software engineer, you can get good stuff down quickly and it's nice to use. Okay. Um, Particularly in the neuroscience domain, you, a lot of the people, it's a very cross-disciplinary domain and not everybody is a coder. Uh, so, you know, particularly for SPM academics providing other academics with a tool, it's nice if they can provide it and a thing that's easy for them to use. And, um, I'm just interested, in what, what are you, do you know what language you're going to be programming in next? I would probably say that we'll do, just off the top of my head, Python and C++ probably. You've had a question in the chat um, from Sarah. GCM was developed for bold signal. How could you translate the model for COVID data? What type of input data did you? Uh, so for one thing to say is I did not do the dynamic cause modeling for COVID-19 work. 
So, um, so let's make that very clear. This is work done by UCL, um, and I'm merely doing a port, looking at a more general implementation. Um, so yeah, how can you translate the model for COVID data? Uh, and it's not too bad. Actually, the model for COVID data ends up being a lot simpler. Because, basically because you don't have to deal with the um, with, with the bold signal. You don't have to deal with the hemodynamics in the brain. You, you, you just sort of skip that bit entirely. It, and it makes things very easy because you, you really can sort of like specify things at the, the simplified level I presented in this talk where you just sort of have one level of probabilistic dynamical system. You don't have to worry about converting your signal which is measuring blood oxygen levels in the brain to like to anything else. Um, th does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, what type of input data do, do you What type of input data you use? Uh, so the, the input data here is um, deaths, uh, deaths by, I can't remember, I think it's John Hopkins provide a daily updated list of deaths for, um, by country for the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that's the, the input to the model. Okay, uh, you had another question from Ant. It says, uh, is the processing heavy parallel and would GP GPU processing be appropriate? Is the processing heavily parallel? Um, a bit. It, again, it's academic code, which is written for academics to use. It's not like high performance industry code. So you know, I, I'm not sure to what extent the, the SPM guys have put an enormous amount of effort into making this quick. Um, would it be appropriate to, to do this? Yeah, probably. Um, like, there are some aspects of this that are very, very parallelizable. And in fact, actually, I could plug um, one of my former colleagues' works uh, in this respect. A guy called uh, Fearfield Champion at um, University of Kent is doing some work which makes this kind of thing very parallelizable. The fact of the matter is, if ultimately here we are dealing with Bayesian graphs, and um, when it comes to updating the state of your Bayesian graph with new information, you don't actually need to do the whole thing at once. You, you can break it up into chunks, and his work is about doing that. Uh, Theophile Champion, I'll. Um, Uh, sure, yeah, that sounds good. Thank you so much. Do we have any more questions? No, oh, I don't think so. It was a thoroughly enjoyable presentation. It's not something I've heard much about before, and it's something I found very interesting. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you for your time.